The Pasuk says, Do not hate your brother in your heart. Give him Musr Lutisal of Chait. You'll be mocham me for a, it's not a joke, but I remember the Rashiva once came into Shir saying, I cannot believe what this person said. Apparently, he was speaking to a certain individual, and the individual had told somebody off and really ranked him out, and the Rashiva sort of asked him, Why did you do that? And the person said, well, simply, it says in the post, don't hate your brother in your heart. You're supposed to scream at him. Don't hate him in your heart. Hate him overtly, loudly. <clears throat> Clearly, that's not what the Pesach is saying. What the Pesach is saying is there is a losa say <clears throat> to hate your brother even in your heart, meaning even just harboring ill feelings, even just having that sense <clears throat> of hatred in your heart, the Torah asks, and then the Torah juxtaposes that to the words <clears throat> to the mitzvah say of giving to chach, of giving rebuke. <clears throat> and do not carry sin. So there's a connection. Don't hate your brother in your heart and give him to chachag, rebuke him, and do not carry his sin on your plate. The Targum explains a very interesting concept here. When the Targum translates the last part of the Pasuk, the Targum says, Don't be makabel, don't accept a chov, an obligation because of him. The Torah says, don't hate your brother in your heart, give him rebuke, and don't end up getting punished because of him implying that if you do not give your brother rebuke, if you don't give him tochacha, you will be punished for his sin. The Torah is telling us, don't do this. Lotis do not carry his sin. Because if you don't rebuke him, you will be punished for his sin. Give him musa, give him tochacha. And the problem with this Targum, I think, is rather straightforward. And that is as follows. If Shimon sits down to eat a ham sandwich, he is the chote. He is the one who sinned. He ate the tray food. Now you could argue that I'm responsible to give him musr. You could argue that if I don't rebuke him, I'm chayev for not rebuking him. But that's not what the Targum is saying. And if you look in the other Rishonim, it's very clear that if I don't give him rebuke, I am held culpable for his sin of eating the sandwich. Not that I'm held culpable for not being concerned for my brother. Not that I'm chayev because I didn't straighten him out. I'm given the punishment of his eating the sandwich. I'm chayev for that punishment. And the problem with the Targum is that it doesn't seem to relate to the understanding that we have. That we're all individuals. You do an act, you're chayev for yourself. I do an act, I'm chayev for myself. Where do we ever see that you do something and I get the punishment for it? And the question is, what's trapped in this Targum? And the other Rishonim will learn this Pasuk that way. And to sort of illustrate this question, I'd like to share with you something that has become a part of New York City culture. In 1964, on a March day, Kitty Genovese, a young woman, 28-year-old woman, was walking in front of the building on Austin Street in 82nd Avenue, very close to this area. A gentleman, Winston Mosley, who was a local individual, was lurking in the shadows. And as she saw him, she began running. He took chase, and she began screaming, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. He took a knife and he stabbed her. She began screeching, Please help, help, help. And it was 3 a.m. Quite a number of building residents turned on their lights, were woken by the sound. They even stuck their heads out the window to hear. One man yelled, let that girl alone, leave her alone, at which point Mosley ran away. When no one else screamed, when no one else called the police, Mosley again attacked her a second time. Somebody turned on a light, he got scared, he got in his car, ran away, saw that no one took chase, came back a third time, found her lying in the hallway. She had been stabbed already. He accosted her. He killed her on the steps. The entire procedure took 30 minutes. Two weeks later, the New York Times heard an article about the 38 residents who heard, did not come to her defense, did not even call the police. And during the trial, when they were asked what was going on, one neighbor said, frankly, we were afraid. Another woman confessed, I don't want my husband involved. A third man who lived in the first building said he was tired, and he decided to go back to bed. 
as this young woman lie bleeding to death, Carl Ross, who lived across the stairwell in the building that she ended up in, said he phoned a friend to ask advice, and the advice was don't get involved. And this became a sort of defining point in the culture of I do not want to get involved. It's not my world, it's not my city, it's not my block, don't get me involved. Now whether every detail happened exactly as the New York Times related or not is still a point of debate, but there's no question that many, many people heard this woman cry, many people did nothing, did not even call the police, and the question is why not? And the answer is that when you're living in a large city, when you're living in a large group of people, there's a tendency to have this attitude, it's not my problem, it's not my issue, it doesn't affect me. And unfortunately, I'm afraid to say that to some extent, this can even affect us, the Amma Nivcha, the chosen nation. When you walk into certain neighborhoods that are large, and they're from neighborhoods, and you walk into a shul, and you get the invisible man syndrome, you walk in and you know that you're not even noticed, not even acknowledged, no one says hello. You get an understanding that to some extent we've fallen prey to this, and to some extent this has seeped into our culture. I don't want to get involved. There's a nameless, faceless entity. It's not my concern. It's not my issue. Now, that is very different than a certain part of the culture in America. There is the opposite that's preached in a very small segment of this country, and that is in the U.S. Marine Corps. Because the U.S. Marine Corps discovered something very, very powerful, and it was really reinforced in Vietnam, and that was the understanding that if you send out four Marines as a unit, each one is dependent on the other. And what that means is if you send out a squad of four Marines, the odds of them coming back alive are pretty good. But if they lose even one man, the odds of them coming back becomes very, very low. You see, each one covers for the other, each one makes sure that his buddy remains intact, and when you have four and each one has his role as a unit, they're very strong and very likely to remain alive. Losing one doesn't bring the odds down to 75%. Losing one brings the odds down dramatically because they exist as an entity and that's how they survive. And because of that, in the marine culture, there's a tremendous sense of interplay, a tremendous sense of dependent one on the other. As a matter of fact, typical marine training involves the fact that if you're late for a drill, if you're slow on a drill, the entire platoon, the entire squad, your group gets punished as a whole because there's an understanding, there's a unit, there's a group. If we all survive, we all survive. If one of us dies, the whole group is in jeopardy and they build a certain culture. The Kliyakar explains that this mushal is very apropos and it's an old mushal but I'd like to share it with you. Imagine for a minute the following. You're on a boat, and you hear some noise in the cabin next door. And it's a rattling. <laughs> and as you hear the rattling and rattling and rattling continue, you notice there's some water coming under your door. And you quickly open your door, and you run to your cabin mate's door, and you see that there's water coming out from his cabin. And you knock on the door, he opens the door, and you see he's got an electric saw. And you say to him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm drilling a hole on my side of the boat. At which point you say, what do you mean? You, you're going to sink us. I paid for passage in this cabin. And this is my right to drill a hole in this boat, and I'm doing it. At which point you quickly unhook his drill, and you try to get some sense into his brain, because if his cabin goes down, the boat goes down, says the Kliyoka, this is an old mushal, because I'll bring it to explain this relationship of the Jewish people. You see, we commonly think of Yahavta Recha Kamocha as a sort of nicety. It's a nice mitzvah. It's a mitzvah say, I should love my brother like myself. I should really feel his pain. <clears throat> this mushal explains that things work a bit differently. There is a unit called the Klai Yisrael. There's a group called the Jewish people, and it's one unit. And if there's a hole in the boat, the boat goes down. And my friends, I believe that that's exactly Pshatnis Targum. 
because there's one unit, when one Jew sins, it's the unit that's jeopardized. We are raven, we are held culpable, we're held responsible, because when you default on your mortgage, if I'm the guarantor, if I'm the cosigner, they're coming after me, that's the relationship that was bonded at Har Sinai, that was formed, there's one unit, there's one group called the Klai Yisrael, and the minute one goes down, it's not of a haftarech a kamocha sort of din. It's not like feel his pain. It's I'm in jeopardy. There's four marines that go into the jungle. <clears throat> if one of them gets taken out, the other three are in deep, serious jeopardy because there's a unit. That's the relationship of one Jew to another. And what the Targum is telling us is a tremendous Kiddush. And that is when Shimon sits down to eat that ham sandwich, I'm in trouble. But I didn't eat it. I didn't ask him to eat it. I don't know him. I never met him. That might have been true prior to Kabbalah Satora. But once there was an acceptance of the Torah on Harsinai, there was a bonding, there was one unit formed out of this Jewish nation, and now things work differently. At this point, if he eats that sandwich, I'm culpable, I'm responsible, and therefore I'm punished for it. If I go ahead and do my best, if I give him to Chacha, if I try to rebuke him, try to set him straight, then I'm off the hook. There's a patur. But without that patur, I'm chayev because there's one unit, and I'm responsible, one group, and I'm held, and held responsible for it, and I'm punished accordingly. And my friends, I believe that this is a huge chiddish in the relationship of one Jew to another, and a huge chiddish in this unit, and a huge understanding in what it means to be responsible for another Jew. And it also brings a tremendous obligation for Tochacha, to Mitzvah Sasei, and we have to do it. And I'd like to share with you that I almost guarantee that this Mitzvah Sasei of Ocheach Tochach is the most, single most, malpracticed Mitzvah on the face of the planet. I do not believe that people practice it correctly. And I do not believe they even have an understanding of the mitzvah. And I believe that without very careful training, without careful coaching, I cannot guarantee that not only won't you fulfill this mitzvah, you'll do the exact opposite of what you're attempting to. And I'd like to explain to you why I believe this is true. There's a recent medical procedure that's come, become much more popular now called a cochlear implant. The part of the ear, <clears throat> unfortunately, there are many people who are profoundly deaf, and there's no hope, with, even with hearing aids, <clears throat> there's no ability to aid the normal hearing process. A cochlear implant <clears throat> is something that goes into the ear. What it does is it receives, there's a microphone, <clears throat> there's a part that's put behind the ear, part that's put on the head, there's a microphone that receives the sound, and that sound is then translated into electrical impulses. There's a part that's inside the brain. And that part inside the brain is actually an <coughs> auditory, it reacts to electrical impulses. The electrical impulses are put right along different parts of the nerve. The patient who gets this implant doesn't hear, but the nerve is simulated in the same way. It's stimulated in the same way as if hearing was happening, and the reality is that people are able to hear they can carry on conversations, they can, without looking, fully hear you, they can speak on the telephone, and right now in the United States there are over 100,000 people who have this, who are profoundly deaf, could not hear, could either were completely deaf, or profoundly deaf, and now are able to speak, and they're able to hear, because it automatically passes the eardrum, goes right to the nerve, and they're able to hear. However, there is an interesting byproduct of this. There's a certain cost that it comes with. And that is, if a person has never heard before, or if they've been deaf for quite a number of years, when they first put in the implant, it's deafening. And I don't mean that to be comical. There's so much noise, but not that it's too loud. There's so much going on. There are street signs, there are sirens, there are doors banging, there are feet walking. There are all types of noise and it gets so overwhelming that oftentimes people have to take it off and just quiet, quiet, I can't stand the busyness. We don't appreciate it. If you've been hearing your entire life, you get accustomed to it, it's normal. But if you haven't heard for a long time or if you never heard, 
Now to suddenly be exposed to so much noise, it's deafening, <clears throat> it's overwhelming, and you have to stop it, you have to shut it off, because it's just too much. I believe that this is a very <coughs> fine muscle <clears throat> to the following. And that is that most human beings, if not every human being, has a sunburn on their ego when it comes to something called criticism. And the criticism is something that is very, very dangerous. For those who remember, there was an old schmooze, number 53, called I Hate Criticism. And in that schmooze, I gave three rules for criticism. And they're pretty simple to remember. Rule number one about criticism is don't do it. Rule number two about criticism is don't do it. And rule number three is don't do it. But why not? Don't do it because criticism antagonizes people. Don't do it because criticizing people alienates them. And don't do it because it causes friction and ill feelings. Nothing good comes of it. When you criticize someone, they don't say, Oh, gee golly, I didn't know that. Thank you so much for telling me. I love you. Ishkaya, thank you. I'm going to change my ways and become a totally different person. They get angry at you. They refute you. They argue with you. It's not that they don't hear. It's the exact opposite effect. All you'd like to happen. All you'd like to happen will be the exact opposite of what you've planned. As a matter of fact, I have a little etza. <clears throat> if you would like to train someone to continue an annoying habit, criticize them about it. If you find somebody who does something that really bothers you, and you'd like to continue that habit of theirs, criticize them, and what you'll find is it becomes worse and worse. Not because they're mean, not because they're nasty, but because if you attack a person, it's self-defense, it's natural, they'll well up against you, they'll defend themselves, and they'll explain why in fact they're right, you're wrong, and your criticism will not accomplish anything other than distancing you from them. And, as a matter of fact, the first rule in human relations is not to criticize. I've mentioned it before, and I believe one of the greatest secular books maybe, certainly in terms of relevancy, that was written in the past century, is Dale Carnegie's book. In 1936, Dale Carnegie wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People, and it is a m tremendous einfalt. It is a brilliant piece, because it explains peopling skills, but explains human relations in such a clear, obvious way. I never had the courage to openly praise the book. I would do it in the high school shear room, but I never had the courage until I heard Reverend Miller. Not only did he praise it, but he recommended buying the old version. In fact, I went out and got not just the current version, I got the one that was originally published in 1936. And you see it is a brilliant book because it explains to you how to deal with people effectively. Not every word is according to the Torah. You have to read it guardedly, but there are tremendous principles in it. Principle number one that Dale Carnegie says over and over is don't criticize. <clears throat> don't criticize because it doesn't work. Don't criticize because it engenders bad feelings. And <clears throat> don't criticize because it accomplishes the exact opposite of what you would like it to do. And as a matter of fact, in that schmooze number 53, the whole focus of that schmooze was because every human being by nature hates criticism. Because each of us has a sunburn on our ego when it comes to criticism. Because each of us is like the, the deaf person who suddenly hears something too loud when we hear criticism. The whole schmooze was focused on the fact that don't do it. Don't criticize your wife, don't criticize your children, don't criticize your workers because it doesn't work. Now if you'll note, we're now up to schmooze 164. It took 111 schmoozim to get to this next point. And that is, well, what do you do with this mitzvah? There is a mitzvah, same in the Torah, that says, Criticism may not work, <coughs> criticism may be damaging, but I have an obligation, <coughs> as a from Jew, to fulfill a mitzvah, same in the Torah. What do I do with that? My friends, I'd like to share with you that has nothing to do with criticism. And as a matter of fact, if you'd like to work on this mitzvah, the first thing you should do is listen carefully to Shmuz 53 and then spend a number of years not criticizing, not being judgmental, not being picky in about other people's issues. And if you spend a lot of time not criticizing, then you can begin working on this mitzvah. And I'd like to share with you what I consider the three rules for properly being Mekayim this mitzvah. And it's not about don't doing it, it's a little bit more subtle. 
The first rule of engagement is if you're going to give musr, if you're going to rebuke someone, if you're going to help them, don't do it pishas maisa. When someone is involved in something wrong and you feel that they're doing something wrong and you feel you can help them, do not criticize them bishas maisa. And as a husband or as a wife, that is a very big deal you sowed. If your wife does something that bothers you and she really is wrong and you're really right, it is a wise man who shuts his mouth. And if you really feel it bothers you and you feel you want to bring it up, don't mention it then. Wait two hours, wait two days, not Bishas Maisa, it's a whole lot easier for a person to be Makabal. The first rule of Tochacha is not Bishas Maisa, not at the time. The second rule of Tochacha is never say the words you're wrong. I was a young fellow in Yeshiva and I was working on Shemun Esrei, and I would imagine that I'm standing in front of Hashem before I begin Shemun Esrei, and I'd picture, as the Mesut Hashem describes, a throne, and Hashem sitting there, and I'm preparing myself to have a conversation, literally speaking to Hashem. So I spend a few moments before Shemun Esrei doing this, and then I begin my Shemun Esrei. One of the very hush of a Kola fellows comes over to me one day after Shachras, and says to me as follows, you know, I just want to share with you, Ramosha says, that there's an Indian to start the tefillah together at the same time as the tzibur. And that was it, and he walked away. My friends, it's not a Ramosha. It's a clear halacha in Shemona Esrei. The ikur tefillah b'tzibur, what makes the davening with the tzibur is that you begin together. The katfili is supposed to begin at the same moment. That's really the, almost the definition of tefillah b'tzibur. But that wasn't what he said to me. He didn't walk over and say, punk, you're <coughs> blowing an open halacha in Shulchan Aruch. This episode of Moshe, I think, somewhere <clears throat> mentions, you know, that it's a good idea to start together with the tzibur. And that was brilliant. Why? Because even though he was much older, much more learned, it would have been a very hard thing for me to hear, I'm wrong. Yeah, but I'm, a, I'm just starting yeshiva, and you're all, it's not, I make pun, you know, it's a hard thing to hear. <clears throat> and if you count your words very carefully, and you never take the frontal attack, and you never point the finger and say you're wrong, and you point out very gently, very subtly, there are other ways to look at this, other ways to approach it, and there might be another approach, it's much more likely that your words will be accepted. But it's the third criteria that makes or breaks whether you're going to fulfill this mitzvah or not. The third criteria is before you walk over to suggest to someone politely and carefully what they should do, Ask yourself the litmus test question. And that is, what are your intentions? If your intentions are the covered shemayim, if your intentions are because this is the right way to do things, then keep your mouth shut. That's not hocheach, tocheach, zamisecha. You're on your horse. You're going out to save the world, but you are not fulfilling this mitzvah. And don't tell me how many people you're saving and how many people you're helping, because you're helping no one, not yourself, and certainly not that other person. The first criteria, which I'm mentioning last, is your intention. And if you look in the Rishonim, and specifically the Sefer Achinach is, says, if your intention is to help him, if your intention is because I love this person and I feel badly, he's wearing his tefillin in the wrong place. He's not fulfilling a mitzvah say deraisa because he's wearing it below the headline and I feel badly. He's putting on tefillin every day and I see the loss and I feel terrible because I, my chavir, my friend is losing out on a mitzvah. Then you're at least there in the ballpark. Your intentions are proper. But if your kavanas are anything other than that, if your kavan is to stand up for the covenant of the base medrash, sha, shh, shh, sh, no talking in shul, sha, kind of chutzpah, say the Torah is open and you people open your mouth, save it. It's not hocheach, tocheach, lamisecha. You're not doing what the Torah says. You may be doing something else, and there may be times when it's appropriate, but don't fool yourself into thinking you're fulfilling this mitzvah. There are other mitzvahs, and again, if you're the rov in shul, or if you were appointed by someone to do that, Pidas Torah, maybe you should. But don't fool yourself into thinking you're fulfilling this mitzvah. And my friends, I know this story for a fact. I know a guy 
who picked up a covering of a shalyat. And in his mind, as he picked it up off the floor, he said to himself the following. As he handed it to the guy, in his mind he said, don't think I'm doing this for you. I'm doing it for Hashem. And my friend, that is rather crumb. Because what he was saying in his mind was, God's important, you're not. And I would never do this for you, I'm doing it for God. Well, that is a rather difficult and anti das Torah concept. <clears throat> because that's God's child, that's God's creation. God gave you a mitzvah to love that person. God gave you an obligation to take care of that person. God gave you an obligation to do chesed for that person. And when you walk over to a person, <clears throat> before you open your mouth, ask yourself what your intentions are. If your intentions are because I love this person and deeply concerned for their good, then maybe consider continuing. But if your kavanas are anything else, give it up. Rav Shtombach brings a phenomenal chiddush. He says a tremendous chiddush. You know, there's a mitzvah haftarach kamocha, and everyone knows that that doesn't apply to a shoyim. You have to love your neighbor like yourself. But if a person's a Russia, the mitzvah doesn't apply. He says Rav Shtombach a fabulous chiddush. That's poshit. What's a Russia? If he's mechal Shabbos, the Fahesha, if he eats Lete Ovon, if he eats Treif, Lahachas, he's only a Russia, says the Gemara, if he was given Tochacha, he was given rebuke, he was Makabal, he said, I don't care and I'm doing it anyway. Says Rosh Tomrach, don't you understand? There's no one in our generation who is fit to give Tochacha, therefore he paskins Allah that the Din Russia that's discussed in the Gemara doesn't apply. To be a Russia, you have to do something that's wicked, receive rebuke and refuse it. Since there's no one in our generation who's capable of giving rebuke, who's capable of giving Tochacha, therefore the status of Russia doesn't apply. And my friends, that's a very, very interesting observation. <clears throat> because what it means is that it's not so simple to fulfill this mitzvah saseh. You can't obviate it, you can't ignore it, you can't say I'm not obligated in it because it's too difficult. But on the other hand, you also can't be flippant about it. And it is a very, very difficult mitzvah to fulfill properly. And I think the Targum is teaching us a tremendous chiddush. And that chiddush is there's one unit called the Klai Yisrael. When Shimon sits down to eat that ham sandwich, I am responsible. We're one unit. We're that marine group that goes into the jungle. If he dies, my life is in jeopardy because that's how tied together we are. And I am responsible for every Jew. Every Jew alive I'm responsible for, and therefore I have an obligation to give him rebuke. But rebuke doesn't mean chastise, rebuke doesn't mean shtach him, put him in his place, get, tell him real good. That is no connection to the mitzvah. And the mitzvah is very, very different. Criticism doesn't work, and rebuke causes the exact opposite. All it does is it causes people to hate one another, and it is very easy to take the attitude of, I don't want to get involved. And you see it in the world at large. You see it in communities. You certainly see it when you walk on Fifth Avenue and you're pressed with this huge throng of humanity and you have to create a wall around yourself and you have to become to some extent callous. But that carries over and that carrying over is very, very dangerous. The Torah obligates us not just to love our neighbor, not just to love our friend, but the Torah obligates us to be responsible. We're one unit. <clears throat> I'm chayev to take care of you. I'm chayev to worry about you. But you see, that's the nakuda. The Sefer Chinuch defines it. I'm worried about your good. I'm worried about your betterment. I'm concerned about your health. I'm concerned about your olam haba. <clears throat> I'm concerned about your family. And therefore, I'm not rebuking you. I'm not chastising you. I'm not putting you in your place. I'm trying to aid. I'm trying to help you. I'm saying words to try to assist you. And those words are very, very different than criticism. Criticism is I'm standing there on my holy podium, putting you down, I'm standing over you and rebuking you. And that's damaging, devastating. One of the cardinal rules of human relations is never to engage in that. But that's not tochocha. Tochocha means to be concerned for my friend and think, what is the way that I could help him? And by the way, it doesn't always mean you have to tell him directly. I remember in yeshiva, there were certain guys who had a reputation for being liars. There were twins, two brothers, who had a reputation of being stark liars. 
They were such bali midas, you could never know what they were saying. Because they were so careful and so guarded in what they'd say and how they'd say it, that you never knew what they were saying. And that actually is a tremendous mila. Because when a person really understands the effect of their words, they're careful, they're guarded. And there are many times when you can help a person in very subtle ways by gently dropping hints, by gently dropping ideas, and that works. But the minute you're going to come on to this direct approach, the minute Bishas Maisi you're going to say the words, you're wrong, understand that your friend is not listening. There's a sensory overload, and you're bashing them down, they're going to fight against you, and you are not fulfilling this mitzvah, you're doing quite the opposite. Don't do it, Bishas Maisa, don't ever say the words, you're wrong. And before you say these words, ask yourself, what is your intention? What is your kavana? Why are you doing this? I'd like to close with one last thought. And that is something that the Shiva showed us very, very carefully. And the Shiva was famous for never, ever criticizing people. And many a time the guys would ask, how come the Shiva doesn't give it to Chacha? How come the Shiva doesn't tell us straight out? In fact, the Shiva at most would sometimes say, Beremiza, Beremiza, and people wouldn't even get it. And the Shiva would often say, I can't give you guys Musr, because your tissue paper, you'll fall apart. It was not that the Shiva didn't know how to give to Chacha, and it was that the Chevra were too soft, and they'd fall apart. It happens to be, I don't know if this is a good point or a bad point, but I was one Zoha to get Musr from the Shiva. The Shiva had told me something, and I didn't realize that the Roshiva really meant it in a serious way. And I didn't, I thought the Roshiva was sort of making light of something. And I didn't stop doing it. And the Roshiva found out I was still doing something. And he gave me a chilek. He really laced into me. Don't get me wrong, he didn't raise his voice. But I could tell that the Roshiva was upset with me. And was upset that I continued doing this. And he said, why are you still doing this? I told you you should stop it. I have to tell you, my friends, I loved the Roshiva with a very powerful, powerful love. And I would always feel such a warmth in the Roshiva's presence. It took a long time for me to get over that. There was a sort of distancing. And even though I knew the Roshiva was saying it for my good, and as a Rebbe to a Talmud was concerned, and I knew it was coming from love, but there was a distancing, and there was a sort of... I, every time I came, spoke to the Roshiva afterwards, it took a while until I got rid of that feeling. And I learned a very important lesson. And that lesson is, if you love your children, don't criticize them. Because you're not helping them. If you love your wife, don't criticize her. Because you're not helping her. And if you really want her to change a given habit, a given activity, the worst thing in the world you could do is to criticize her about it. Because number one, she's not going to love you more for it. Number two, you're not going to help her deal with the issue. You have to be very, very wise, very, very guarded. You have to first ask yourself, what is your intention? Are you concerned for the good of this person? If you are, use your head. What's the strategy? What's the best approach? What are the right words that are going to work? I've heard it said in the name of Einstein, one of the signs of insanity is doing the same activity time after time and expecting different results. Somehow it is, when it comes to criticism, people expect different results. Every time you criticize someone, you get the same result, but this time it's gonna be, I'm going to give it to him good, I'm going to lace into him, and he's really going to learn the lesson. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. And it's not the mitzvah. The mitzvah is to deeply care, deeply be concerned, understand the Torah is teaching us there's a relationship, there's a bond, there's a unit, and when I understand that I'm achroi, I'm responsible, then I have to think, how can I accomplish my goal? My goal is to help my chavar, my goal is to help them. What words, what strategy can I imply? When I do that, when I think long and hard, then Hashem helps, and a person finds the way out. May Hashem grant us the wisdom, understanding, ability. Please join us after tomorrow for a quick Hakdash Shmuz session.